welcome to the sports guys for another edition of weekend update november 11th 2024 this is veterans day i just want to do a shout out to all the veterans out there whether you're serving now whether you served in the past whether you're a family member supports just thank you so much we can't give you enough thanks as a country and as a people for those folks that that gave the ultimate sacrifice and those folks who are protecting us today so thank you and hope you had a great veterans day I want to welcome back zach thompson how you doing zach Hey, good, Thomas. Thanks for having me. So glad hey, you're Zach. back on the show, man. And, uh, you know, we had to bring on Mr. Bronco, man. The Broncos are rising. Yeah, they're getting, they're, they're, they're doing their best, man. I've, I've, I've been real impressed with my team. Uh, I think we're uh, getting better every week. Uh, and like we were just talking about, our defense is uh, really doing well. And Bo Nix is starting to step up. So really excited to see how the rest of the season unfolds for us. It's going to be fun. How are you doing, Robbie? I'm doing well. Really well, thanks. Good, man. Well, Robbie, let's start with you, man. What are the, some of the big highlights coming out of the weekend you want to highlight for the people? Uh, decent amount of upsets in college football. I said that over the last two weeks, <clears throat> we would know a lot about the playoff picture, and I think that's true. I think we know something even more true, and that is every team this year is beatable and has flaws. Um, the only th the closest thing to an unbeatable team is Oregon, but I wouldn't I wouldn't put them in that category. I think if they played Georgia and Texas, one of them would win. So um, the it's just interesting. There, there's really no powerhouse teams that are unbeatable this year. So it is pretty exciting, and, and it's a really great year to break out the 12 team playoff. I completely agree with that. What about you, Zach? What came out of the weekend that hit you other than your close loss to the Chiefs that you thought maybe you were robbed? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a tough loss. Still swallowing that pill, but um, I'm gonna agree with Rob here. And um, you know, the tra I think the transfer portal has a lot to do with that. Uh, you know, um, a lot of people are saying that uh, Georgia losing to Ole Miss is an upset. I get it. Like. Uh, Georgia hasn't lost to anybody besides Alabama in the regular season in what, like 50 some games, right? But mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't see it as an upset. I think Ole Miss was executed well enough to beat Georgia, and mm -hmm. I, as we can see, Georgia has obvious flaws. I don't think they're the powerhouse team that they used to be. Um, the Alabama LSU game, I thought Alabama would steamroll LSU. I just had that feeling. And um, that was really exciting. And like Rob said, Oregon, and I would even put Ohio State in that category, even though they've had some flaws, I think they're your top two favorites right now to, win, agree with that. to college football playoffs. Yeah, I agree with that. Same thing for me coming out of the weekend, the big upsets. And to me, what is amazing is the best two defenses in the SEC right now are Ole Miss and South Carolina. It's insane. Statistically, those are the two best defenses. And so when you say that LSU, Georgia, and Alabama are not the two best defenses, they really aren't. They're all very vulnerable. Cool. And you see Georgia got run all over by Ole Miss. They were ramming yep. it down their throats. And that's not a championship defense in my mind. Mm -hmm. So I really have a lot of concerns for Georgia. I really do. After that game, they just got bludgeoned by Ole Miss. So uh, I, agree, I agree with both of you. I think I think that there's no dominant team this year. I think Ole Miss is beatable. I mean, no. I mean, uh, Oregon is beatable. Mm -hmm. And um, it's going to be – it makes the tournament even more exciting. It makes a lot like the basketball tournament because you really don't know what's going to happen. Well, I was looking at a lot of defensive stats today, and I was surprised how good Ole Miss is. Um, Texas has actually been leading the country in a lot of stats throughout a lot of the year. So Texas is technically the best defense in, in the SEC, but Ole Miss is really far up there. And if you look at offensive and de defensive stats, it kind of tells a story of why they're such a difficult team to play. Um, the biggest mm -hmm. disappointment for Georgia has been, out of all things, its offensive line. It hasn't been dominating. If you look at the, the hurries and the sacks they're giving up and the lack of running production, it's an – abnormally bad offensive line for a Georgia team. Rob, you think about Jackson Dart from Ole Miss got hurt in the first series. They bring in the backup quarterback. The backup quarterback throws 10 passes the entire game. Mm -hmm. Two of them touchdowns. And um, and otherwise, they just ran it down their throats. And they knew the run was coming and they couldn't stop it. And that's, that's Georgia. Right. So it's real concerning. 
He really is. Also, I think a big thing for Georgia is, uh, and a, a lot of people said this at the beginning of the season, is Brock Bowers' effect. That you know that was that was Beck's guy. I don't think Beck. I don't think Beck has a guy right. No, now. he had a second guy too. His name was Lad McConkey, and he's on the 49ers now. Yeah. So he, his top two targets from last year are gone. And that really hurts. Yeah. Me. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. Coming out of the NFL, I had the same reaction. Um, you have a very vulnerable nine and zero team in Kansas City that can be beaten by virtually anybody, but because they have the best coach and best quarterback, they find a way to eke these wins out. I don't know how mm-hmm. they do it. You have the Baltimore Ravens, who may be the second or third best team in the AFC that have a complete trash defense. I mean, not a championship defense at all, not even a top 20 defense. So they have a lot of problems on the defensive side. You have um, really all the other teams that are good in the AFC all have problems. You know, the Chargers have a tendency to some games score 27 and some games to score 13. And so, so there's a lot of vulnerable people. I think the best team – in the AFC is likely the Kansas City Chiefs, but they're beatable. And the best team on the NFC side is the Lions. And uh, and they're beatable too. So I heard an interesting stat today, and I hope I get it right um, because I'm going off memory while I was doing something. Um, it's something like 24 out of the last – sorry, 20 out of the last 24 uh, Super Bowl champions had a top five defense. Mm-hmm. So you don't just go in there and outscore your opponent very sure. often. So if you want to set yourself up for a win, you're going to be able to run the ball and really play a top defense. I mean, Baltimore can, can celebrate the fact that they beat a really great, you know, Cincinnati quarterback in um, Mr. Burrow, but what they can't celebrate is looking at the score sheet and you had um, Jamar Chase have the greatest wide receiver day in NFL history. (laughs) He got me 50 points in fantasy and Mm -hmm. And so they have real problems. In a lot of cases, the Bengals had three guys running free on every play in the secondary. And so I, I don't know what Ravens are going to do, but unless they tighten up a little bit, I don't see them lasting very long in the playoffs. The thing I have heard, though, is um, if anyone can tighten that defense up a little bit, it's Harbaugh. Possibly. He's, he's 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 a he's the man for that job right there to get that straightened out. You know, on offense, Lamar Jackson's having one of the greatest seasons of all time. So, I mean, he's just tearing it up. He's probably going to get his third MVP, and he's better with um, a running game, which he finally has this year with Henry. And so, offensively, they're fine. They just have got to figure out the defensive side. Yeah. So, any other big themes come out of the weekend before we go to the material? Yeah, I just want to – I think I said this in our first video, and I just want to say it again. I think the Eagles are real, man. <laughs> and, yeah. I, and I feel like we say it every year. <laughs> it feel, it, we're getting to that point where the, it, I feel like the Eagles' offense is clicking. I'm worried about their defense. Uh, their defense is, uh, you know, not – it's a lot better than it was last year, I feel like. I, I'm sure we all remember when the Buccaneers just absolutely sliced and diced that secondary in the playoffs. But, um, you know, I, I think the Eagles uh, got it figured out. That Saquon Barkley move, man, got oh, it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, he's got he's got to feel like he gets you down to the one-yard line and then Jalen Hurts steals the touchdown every time. Love it for me. Got him on fantasy. But I just think that a uh, punk and that, uh, punch and pack uh, backfield is just doing good things because the quarterback's so mobile. What was interesting is the Eagles were struggling defensively early in the year, and their defense has really come on now. And all the old picks they got the last couple of years were all playing well. But guess who's playing really well? Is their three starting rookies, yeah. including including Cooper DeGean. And you remember in our draft special, Zach, we talked about them as having maybe the second draft class this year. Their draft class was mm-hmm. fantastic. They had 12 picks. And not and only they, that, but last hit, year – They hit on a lot of them. Last year they really struggled at getting pressure. So the way you beat the Eagles was for, you could run on them too. Their defensive line was young. It was all Georgia, and they were getting manhandled. And this year they're holding their own. I mean, Jalen Carter's having a nice season. I think he got a little banged up, but he's playing well, and they're, they're getting pressure, and that's helping those DBs a lot. The secondary is the beneficiary of that defensive line playing better. And on offense, there's very few teams that have the tandem they have at wide receiver. Now, those guys were out a couple of games this year, and they struggled. But yeah. when A.J. Brown is on the field, yeah, Hurts is a different quarterback. And, yep. Yeah, uh, for sure. Because I, 
because I feel like the Eagles are sometimes a run first team. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, once they establish the run, that's when Devontae Smith and A.J. Brown are just so dangerous. And, uh, you know, when they weren't on the field, that's when it was like, okay, we know they're just going to run the ball. They're going to try to jam it down our throat. And that's just not going to work. And did you see yeah, when they the were part? out? They were doing nine men in a box and stopping Barkley. But yeah. when you play a traditional defense against Saquon, he's going to gash you. Did yes. you see what he was doing against the Cowboys on a couple of those drives, especially that one where he scored from the five yard line? What yeah. he can do now, now that he's got his full complement of weapons, what he does, he spreads them out and he does all that misdirection where he fakes the handoff to Saquon, he fakes the pitch to um, Smith, the wide receiver coming on the jet sweep. And then the whole thing just opens up for him, like, you know, the, the Red Sea. And he just waltzes into the end zone. And, it's, man, they're going to be tough to stop, the Eagles, yeah. when they're fully, fully healthy. You know, the biggest thing holding the Eagles from winning the Super Bowl is their coach. Sirianni yeah. is the biggest liability they have. I'm Otherwise, not sure about that. I think they found a nice balance. He doesn't do anything, but he also doesn't do anything to hurt them. So I think they're kind of starting to warm up to him a little bit. But you know who runs that team is the coordinators. That's and right. so yeah. they're doing a good job with that. And uh, I think it's kind of working right now. Um, the, the offensive line is is sort of retooled. They got a, a little more younger guys on there than last year. Mm -hmm. um, the wide receivers are spectacular. The running game is legendary. And the quarterback, you know what they did? The, the offensive coordinator said we're going to – stop asking him to be a pocket quarterback mm -hmm. on every play and drop back and pick mm -hmm. defenses apart. We're going to let him run a lot more. And that opens up his throws. So if you look at his running stats for the last four weeks, they're unbelievable. He's scoring and, two touchdowns a game, running the ball in. And he throws and, well in the run too. He's one of those. And he kind throws of well in the run. And he yeah. also throws well when you're not asking him to throw too much. Mm -hmm. He's not the yeah, they best. They're keeping him to 22 back. throws and below. Mm -hmm. That's like yep. their target. So yep. uh, they tend yeah, to be more yeah. open so you can hit that open guy. And so Hertz, they have the right formula for him. He is a running quarterback who throws decently. Okay. Okay. So all year, He's you've not had a pocket the, quarterback who's going to pick you apart. So mm -hmm. all year you've had the Detroit Lions as the number one team in the NFC. And uh, for a while it was the Vikings were number two. Then it was for a little while, the Packers were number two. Then it was the commanders number two. And now everyone's slotting the Eagles as the number two team in the NFC. And I think that's right. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're a contender. I agree with you, Zach. Well, let's go take a look at our material. <clears throat> All right, so this is our weekend update, November 11th, 2024, Veterans Day. I had a couple themes here. The first one was the Ole Miss upsets, quote-unquote, Number three, I think, Zach, you're right. I think the people that really know SEC football didn't really consider this an upset because <laughs> of the way Ole Miss had been playing for the three weeks prior to this, and they had been really bullying people. And some of the, the real faults that we talked about Georgia has right now, and that they clearly are struggling a little bit and not quite the team we thought they were. And then uh, we've got all these quarterbacks on the screen that um, there's really kind of a theme coming out of the NFL this year that this may be the golden age of quarterbacks in the NFL. You essentially have about 20 teams or more that have their guy, that have their franchise guy. And you have, of course, starting with Lamar, Josh Allen, you know, Hertz, uh, Kyler Murray is playing like an all pro. Herbert is playing great. Um, Goff, one of the best quarterbacks in the league. You have Russell Wilson, who's reasserted himself and actually has brought a deep ball component to the Steelers that they didn't have with Fields. And then, of course, uh, who's likely to be the rookie of the year, Jaden Daniels. So what are you guys' thoughts about these two themes coming out of college and the pros? I mean, I would like to say that, first of all, Russell Wilson, I don't know why you couldn't play like this when you were with us. But... Right. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that interesting? <laughs> but, no, um, I really think, uh, you know, a lot of people questioned it when they um, – bench Justin Fields for Russell Wilson. And even I wasn't a believer. I didn't and, believe it either. I didn't know why they were doing it. Yeah. Now, and, I, now I do though. Yeah. Okay. And it, I just, like you said, I feel like uh, with George Pickens and now they have uh, Mike Williams, mm -hmm. I feel like those, especially with George Pickens, 
any 50-50 ball, he's probably going to win it. I mean, he yeah, has, said he has the highest radius, the largest radius of any receiver in the league. Yeah, he, he's he's incredible. So I, I think that's one of the biggest wins as far as quarterbacks for the NFL this season. But even that touchdown throw he made to Williams, why is it that Aaron Rodgers couldn't make Mike Williams work? You know, why can Aaron Rodgers not make him work? And that's because that's because Aaron Rodgers should have retired. Um, well, well, the Jets are a dysfunctional franchise. Yeah. So, and then my, what's your theory about why Russell didn't work in Denver? Now all of a sudden he's resurgent. What's your theory? I don't think we had the protection for him like we do Bo Nix, honestly. And um, I just don't think the scheme quite uh, fit him. Uh, I don't know. It's what, what do you it, think? It what do you think? It's what Colin Cowherd thinks, which is Colin said that um, he and Peyton just didn't mesh. They were oil and water. That was it. Yeah. Yeah, it was 100%, I think. Peyton yeah. is very kind of strict authoritarian type coach, and that's not what Wilson uh, responds to. Yeah, He's and, not, I, and I, I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of Sean Payton. I, I'll go ahead and say that. I, I, I've never been a fan of him. Um, but I think that Bo Nix and him click very well because mm -hmm. I think Bo Nix is the type to challenge him in a mm -hmm. way as a coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm sure you've seen the headlines. I, see he, I think he liked it. I think he liked it. He loved it. it. He, he loved, loved it. it. He would never tell you that, but he loved it. Yep. And uh, so I think, and I think you're right. I think Russell Wilson is a guy that um, he he kind of wants praise in a way. He wants to be coddled. He wants yep. to be coddled. And, uh, and I, I'm happy for him. I, you know, never like to see someone. I, I did not want his career to end like that. I hate that he's doing it for another team, but I'm glad that you know he's having a good year. So I think the two guys that have surprised me the most on this on this board here, none of them surprised me except for Jalen Hurts, who I kind of said was washed up, and I didn't think he'd ever be the guy. And I think that he's playing really well right now. But Kyler Murray, the way he's playing, I mean, nobody wants to play the Cardinals. They're sitting at six and four. They have a really good shot at winning that division, and everybody they play, they just bludgeon the last couple of weeks. And uh, the way he's playing, he's just so hard to defend. He gives you that 11th attacker. And uh, I don't know. What do you guys think of these two number ones? I mean, I think Kyler Murray has a true wide receiver one now. And mm -hmm. I think that's what really researched him. But he's also, like, playing with a chip on his shoulder mm -hmm. in a way, you know. Yeah. And, and so, uh, I mean, when he got hot, I'm sure you all seen him get hit the other day. And he was, he just laughed it off and just, he was like, that's fine. I'm going to put 30 on your head. And that's what he did. So, I mean. You know, what's crazy is he's playing so loose. Like I haven't seen, he's usually real tight. He's really loose this year. Yeah. He's just letting it fly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll give Rob credit before the year we picked who we thought we're going to make it. I picked him to be about four and 11 or something or four and 13 and said they wouldn't make the playoffs. And Rob disagreed. He said, I'm telling you right now, the Arizona Cardinals, watch out for those guys. They could sneak in the, in the wild card. They were sneaky. They were coming, and, and nobody and saw it. i got to give you credit yeah. for that because uh, you mm -hmm. saw this, this research. I saw improvement coming. I wasn't sure the degree, but I could see that Murray had this got this huge contract, what was it, two years ago, mm -hmm. had egg on his face for underperforming dramatically. He's a coach's son, and, which means that he has to study. Um, and I know that the knock on him was they had this contract where he needed to do film and all this. I think he was so embarrassed that I think he's a different person. And he got uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. Fast, which really yeah. helped. <laughs> Marvin Harrison Jr. and a healthy John Connor, which is just well, you know. right. I mean, they're running their their balance attack. He himself is a mismatch nightmare. He's so fast. Yeah, I mean, he's underrated as a runner with the ball. Mm -hmm. He's got mm -hmm. an incredibly strong arm. He's got a mm -hmm. cannon. Mm -hmm. uh, very accurate. He's a good quarterback. He's just short. So you got to make, I'd move him on every play out of the pocket. Mm -hmm. I would, um, I'd have him on the move and I would not have him being blocked by the, all the, all the lanes blocked by all these huge linemen. So what do you guys um, think about the theory of this being the golden age of quarterbacks in the NFL? Like the, the theory there is that there's never been this many bona fide, you know, top 10 type guys. I don't agree with that, but I think it's coming back up again. Um, I think we, we had a down period. I think mm -hmm. we had a down period when, when, when Manning was hurt and kind of on his way out and Brady wasn't there, there wasn't much left. 
Mm-hmm. And I think we're, we're having young guys come back up again to get closer to where they were, but we don't have any Marino Elway Brady's here mm-hmm. True. right now. I don't think, True. I mean, if you look at the throwing statistics, the scoring, it's all down. It's just, I, it's, I don't it's remember. Getting better. It's improving, getting closer to back where we used to. I don't remember 22 teams having their guy ever. I, I don't remember it being this broad in terms of guy, the teams feeling like they really have their guy now. I think um, I think of what Rob's maybe trying to say and something that I've been thinking about is I think we have more, not necessarily like, like they're good quarterbacks, but they're also they're game managers, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. So quarterback play has changed so much now. You know, we're, we're doing short outs. We're doing – I mean, Jared – I think Jared Goff, if you look at him, like how many games – I think he's had like three or four games where he's been almost perfect. I think he was perfect one game, right? But if you look at the degree of difficulty of like his throws those games, he's yeah. not making any difficult throws, right? So mm-hmm. uh, last night when he got put in situations where he had to make difficult throws, what happens? Five interceptions. Five, five interceptions. Not, <laughs> yeah. not, not all, not all on him. I'll say yeah. probably two True. of them were probably truly yeah. his fault. But what I'm like when I look at somebody like uh, Daniels, Jaden Daniels, I think he is a stud quarterback. He is know, a stud. with his arm talent and everything. Like he's, but a lot of these guys like Jared Goff, um, Josh Baker. Allen, they like. The, the, I mean, these guys are, I mean, they're managing their team so well, but they're even not- Sam Darnold. I mean, he had all that success the first six games because he's got, you know, Justin Jefferson and he's got yeah. Addison and all these great weapons. But then yeah. once he gets you in the red zone, that that's where okay, he'll get you to the red zone every time. But right. Right. <laughs> that's right. Well, let's take a look so at this. What I, what I would say is it's improving. But it went down for a while, and so I wouldn't call it a golden age. I would just say it's it's better than it was three years ago. Yeah, yeah. Let's take a look at the scores from this past week. We got the Ravens with that big win over the Bengals. I thought that this was a huge missed opportunity. I personally would not have gone for two at the end of the game. No uh, way. All, all the pundits on TV on every channel said that the, that was the right decision. Zach Taylor was right to do that. He was on the road. They really needed the win. He um, that you don't want to put your you know team at risk for injury and all these things. Uh, I just happen to disagree. I just think you, go ahead and tie that game up, take it to overtime. The way Burrow was playing, I don't know. What do you think, Zach? Yeah, I don't. So I was going to follow this up with a question to you. So I wouldn't have went. To, I wouldn't have went for two in this game at all. But uh, Tampa Bay against the Chiefs the other week, I would have went for two there. Okay. Um, so I think that's a different uh, sort of playing field in a way. The Rob and I talk about this all the time, that, that the coaches are so beholden to analytics these days. Analytics is like the big thing the last five years. Analytics, analytics. They go for a fourth and one all the time. You know, And, and maybe, maybe that's what it really says when you run it through the computer. But to me, this is a game the Bengals really had to have. They're on the road. They can tie it up. I like my chances with Burrow in overtime. Yeah, me know. too. If so, I didn't have Burrow, maybe, but you have Burrow and Chase, and your offense has been unstoppable most most of the season. You yeah. have to give your team an opportunity to win. So uh, analytics is fine, but when do you put reason into the mix? That's what I don't understand. What, they never listen to the reason side of it. And also, I mean, uh, to me, um, that the play itself. You got you got your one on one with Jamar Chase, and the right. ball doesn't go his direction. I don't understand that, That's and right. I, I don't know if you've seen the interview where they asked, "Were you open?" And he, of course, said, "Well, I'm always open. I'm always open," but, <laughs> which but, is kind but, of true, especially against yeah, the Ravens. <laughs> but 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 you know they uh, they did that stack on purpose. They switched. They did the motion to get him one on one, and the ball. Right. I, I just – I didn't know. But, um, yeah, I wouldn't have went for two there. But with the – back to the Tampa Bay thing, I thought they had no business being that close with Kansas City. But they were. And it was kind of – you knew if Kansas City won the toss, it was over. Right. And um, so that's where I would have just tried to put that game away right there. Yeah, I would agree with that. So next one's my Panthers finally get another win. Two games in a row that they won a game, which is a miracle. Played a really bad Giants team. Uh, probably should have put this one away, but let the Giants sneak back into it. 
but found a way to win it in overtime. Um, was really pleased with Bryce Young and some of his decision making. He was throwing the ball out of bounds, but he didn't have anything. He wasn't taking sacks. Uh, he was getting it to the right guy who was open. He was handing the ball off to Chuba Hubbard, who had a big game. Uh, Panthers defense has slightly improved the last couple of weeks, which really helps. Any thoughts about this game? Daniel Jones is absolutely atrocious. <laughs> I mean, True. It, it, it's it's time it's time. I don't know, like I, I just don't understand that whole whatever. But um, you won't hear me say a lot of good things about Bryce Young. But it was it felt like something clicked with him this game and he and it's not like the giants have a bad defense because they don't that's right and i thought this is it's almost like he's getting some confidence and um i'm happy for that he's smiling he's laughing he's more comfortable i don't know what they did but somehow he's just as the pressure goes away because they took the starting role away from him it's allowed him to just sort of relax and be himself and i think maybe um Bruce Arians said it. I've seen him win a national title with good players. Obviously, he can do good things. It's just a matter of the situation. Right. And I'm a big fan of sitting a quarterback if they're not playing well. Give them a little time to regroup, to look at it from the sideline. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a punishment. It's really more of an investment in their future. I think – when you don't do that, you end up with a Caleb Williams on his back having to be helped up by the other team instead of his own team, which is what happened. And, and, what's the, and what's Everyone the, starts to turn on your young quarterback that you're forcing in there, a round peg in a square hole. You know, you need him to be more of a, of a square peg. <laughs> you know, like you need him to reshape himself. And what's the and formula? Young, for- young quarterback needs that time. What's the formula for winning games in the NFL? Because most games are around this score, 23-17, 23-20, 20-17, is play good defense, run the ball, clock control, don't make mistakes. Two-minute uh, drill, third two down. Two-minute drill, that, that's, go to that's the right the receiver. your quarterback. Get it to the right receiver, let him run after the catch. Um, no turnovers. I mean, that's the formula. And all of a sudden, the last couple of weeks, the Panthers are doing that formula. Yeah. Which is the Hubbard. Yeah, I mean, I just totally agree because Bryce Young, these past two games, he just came in. I always, I always joke to you know he's BY nine. My nephew is a big lover of him. I called yeah. him B, I called him BY six because every time he threw it, the other team was going for six. And <laughs> right. but you, but you know he he's got it under control. And yep. um, that, he's relaxing, he, and yep. and they're not asking him to do too much. And there's no expectation that he's going to go in there and win the game for you. And should so, we give? Shouldn't we give Canales some credit here? Yeah, he's the one absolutely. Working with him. First thing he did, put him on the bench. That's number one. That's a good move, not to punish him, but to to. I would look at him and just say, "We're doing this for your future. We're yeah. we're restarting you. You know, we're gonna slowly yeah. put you in positions where you're gonna mm-hmm. to dabble." I mean, I watched him do this with Tua. He played a few games and was terrible, mm-hmm. and then they put in, they pulled him out and said, "You need to watch more." They put in uh, Mad, um, um, what's his name? Dalton. The uh, the crazy bearded Fitzpatrick. Fitzpatrick. Fitzmagic. Oh, yeah. Fitzmagic. They put in Fitzmagic, and uh, Tua found that to be very valuable learning time. Mm-hmm. And then he That's came true. back the next year and started, and he's been good ever since. That's it's true. arguable whether he's worth you know as much money as he's making now, but. He's a right. very good quarterback. The Dolphins are dramatically better with him. And he learned from it. He developed from it. Yeah. He developed from his time on the bench, and they should be doing the same thing with Caleb Williams, I think, honestly. So, so this next game is a head-scratcher. You had the number three pick, Drake May, absolutely bludgeon the number one pick, Caleb Williams. And this was a complete team breakdown by the Bears, and you had them lose to one of the worst teams in football, and you had them make Drake May look like an all-pro quarterback. Patriots um, had nine sacks. Nine sacks. Any thoughts on this game? They said, by the way, six of the sacks were Caleb's fault, <laughs> that he should have either gotten the ball away or or something. But yeah. um, any thoughts about how this game could have come to be and what's happened to the Bears? I mean, with- I, would let, I would like to know where this great Bears defense is that everybody talks about. Where has that been? Um, it's not. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's- yeah, exactly. Um, 
Hasn't been great since Erlacher was there. And, and how, how is it that Drake May looks like the more prepared quarterback than Caleb Williams? Because he sat point? for the first half of the season. And he yeah. got to sit there and kind of learn how you carry yourself and right. how you deal with adversity. And you're carrying the clipboard. You're, you're taking mental notes. It's a good totally, thing to do totally for a young command. quarterback. He looked totally in command, totally in control. He was hitting the right receivers, wasn't making mistakes, wasn't taking sacks. And uh, he, and Caleb was the complete opposite. He was totally frazzled the entire game, overthrowing guys, missing guys in the end zone. Yeah, Zach's, Zach's point is right. The, the Bears' defense is pretty bad. And so it's going to make quarterbacks look better than they actually are. Um, so when you play the Bears, most likely, most of the time, you're going to have a decent day. So that's part of it is if you had put him up against Minnesota – Drake May wouldn't have looked like that. So isn't Eber Flus a, a defensive coach? <laughs> yes. So he's walk a you know, dead man walking at this point. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's a he's a goner. Yeah. But third downs, um, New England was five of fourteen and Chicago was one of fourteen. So the same wow. amount of tries at it and five versus one. Wow. You know, there, there's a lot of stats that kind of point out what happened in that game. But at the end of the day, I mean, Caleb were you guys, were, nine times. Were you guys as impressed with Drake many as I was? I mean, I just, I didn't see this coming. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I was impressed with him. I thought he played well the game before as well. Um, yeah. But mm -hmm. I also don't think that he's seen a true defense yet. True. Um, so, true. but um, as far as his composure coming in, I think he looks awesome. Um, yeah. Tom, I've that always be... said that, um, I'm I'm the I'm this weird guy who thinks that Herbert is a good model of this, where if you have an amazing third year or second year, and you follow it up with a bad year because all your guys go NFL, and your supporting cast gets dramatically worse, and all of a sudden your stats look worse, a lot of teams push you down the 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 rank order in draft, mm -hmm. and in my opinion, quarterbacks don't forget how to play. OK, mm -hmm. so when a, when a quarterback like Herbert used to be, he was thought of as potential number one pick. Uh, and then he went into his fourth year in, at Oregon and had a disappointing year and he right. fell pretty dramatically. And I think you can get a really good value of a quarterback who looked good in his second and third year and worse in his fourth. If you can find out why he got worse, if you look at he had star receivers and, and running backs and linemen and all this stuff. And he did in his fourth year, you have a value pick there. And I think Drake may was a perfect example of that. He had a really nice career going and he had a really disappointing year right before the draft. Mm -hmm. And I would have picked Drake may, I wouldn't have gone up the ladder like they did to get him. That was, I think mm -hmm. that was crazy. But I agree with that. Yeah. if they hadn't done that, I think he would have been on the board a while. I think it's pretty wow. remarkable these uh, rookie quarterbacks that have come in. Some of them started right away, some of them second half, but pretty remarkable to see these guys and the contributions they're making. That's what I feel. So this next game, uh, the Bills took care of the Colts. Uh, Joe Flacco starting for Richardson, who got benched and made a bunch of inexplicable picks and bad mistakes that he usually doesn't make. He's usually a really good veteran quarterback who – Plays really well, and he didn't in this game. Uh, and secondly, the Bills just kind of dismantled the Colts' defense. Um, James Cook running wild. Keon Coleman still coming on. And, uh, of course, you had Josh Allen have a really nifty uh, touchdown run of his own. Any thoughts on this game? Bill, Bills could have easily won this game 50-20. to 20. It was, uh, there, was, there were so many different collapses by them where – Colts would turn the ball over, and then Bills would turn it right back over to them. Yeah, you know, the quarterback play in this game was really substandard Yeah, on, on both sides. Mm -hmm. Allen did a lot of nice work with his feet, but mm -hmm. I wasn't real impressed with him throwing the ball. Yeah, He made a lot of mistakes. Uh, he threw the ball way too many times considering they have that running game. Mm -hmm. um, he threw 37 times for 280 yards, and uh, he had zero touchdowns throwing and two INTs. Yep. So, so a lot of mistakes. His legs, but he wasn't very impressive in the air at all. A lot of mistakes, but the better team won. Is essentially who came into this game. Yep. Well, the Colts made dramatically more mistakes, so it was it was a real sloppy, mistake-filled game. It was crazy. Yeah. And you can give some credit the, to the defenses, but I think it was really Colts, poor quarterback play. I think. 
I think the Colts turned the ball over four times in the red zone or some something like that. Like it yeah. was like if this game could easily it, it should to me, in my opinion, the Bills should have blown them out. But the yeah. way it played out was the Colts could have easily snuck away with this game too. I think they would have blown the Colts out if they had had um, Cook run the ball more Agreed. and just pound right. it down their throat, maintain the ball. They would have had more possessions that ended in scores. It would have been a higher scoring. And Amari score. Cooper sat out again with a hit, uh, with an injury. I wonder when they're going to start getting some production out of Amari Cooper because once they do, now they're going to be two-headed monster on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. So – well, uh, Coleman was playing playing hurt or out. I can't remember. He was playing hurt and Amari Cooper was out. So yeah, he was throwing a lot to Kincaid and. So they had no business throwing that much. <laughs> I mean, yeah, right. you know, just yeah. not a good game plan. But they they got it done because the Colts were so bad. When they get all their weapons back, the Bills are going to have a really nice passing game. I agree. That's what I believe. I think they should go for a little more balance. So next yeah. one was the Saints upsetting the Falcons with uh, Ku, the kicker for the Falcons, who I have on my fantasy team, missing three field goals and shouldering all the load of this loss on himself. Totally inexcusable for the Falcons who are trying to win this division and should win this division, um, continuing to falter like this. They'll win a game, lose a game, and to lose to a really pathetic Saints team. Um, any thoughts on this one and why? Falcons keep messing up like this every other week. Derek Carr is the most inconsistent quarterback in the NFL. He's got to be. He, yeah. it, it, it is so it is so funny to watch him like against the Panthers, how he cannot get anything going, and then he comes in here and he looks like prime Brady for a second, and I'm like, what is going on, right? But yeah, the Falcons. Uh, I mean, they sh they're sh they're shooting themselves in the own foot right now, and um, I don't. I'm I'm not. I haven't really figured out what it is that's causing it, if that makes sense. Because some weeks they look absolutely great, and then this week they look so far. But they could have they could have won this game with proper special teams plays. Every time I see this happen to them, every other week, I just think to myself. Tampa's going to take this division, you know, even without yeah. wide receivers, like all their wide receivers are hurt. But I just think to myself, you know, Baker is playing the best in that division. Of all the Absolutely. Players. Yeah. They're banged up too. The box. I mean, that's what I'm saying. If they really had all the receivers. My, my thoughts on this game are that first of all, I got to give props to Valdez Scandling. He was unbelievable in this game. Absolutely. I, I can't remember a game where he was dominant like that. Mm -hmm. He's always been pretty good, but he was a, a wide receiver one on fire, you know? Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, every time I looked up, he was going long and, and catching a bomb. Mm -hmm. um, he had two TDs and uh, how many yards? 109. Um, mm -hmm. But that was – he had three receptions. You know, he, he was just mm -hmm. unstoppable when he went for it. And um, in addition to that, the three missed field goals for Atlanta, three out of four coup missed. I know. That's it's your good. game right there. The uh, like special teams left a lot to be desired in the NFL this weekend. We're going to talk about that in a little that's bit. That's three wasted yeah. opportunities um, down the field where you're in good field position. The so kicking, the kicking had actually been on record pace to be the yeah. best kicking ever early in the season, but the last two weeks. No, no, not just not just early in the season until this week, really. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And some of the inexplicable misses, really, the last two weeks, but especially this week, have been. Yeah, this uh, week it was bad. There was a lot of misses. So let's talk about your game, Zach. I'm not going to let Rob and me talk until I hear from you. What's your takeaway on this one, both good and bad? What are the positives coming out of it? What are the negatives? And are the Chiefs this good? Or was it all the refs? Was it, you know, the Broncos just couldn't get enough going in the second half? Yeah, I thought uh, the first half we absolutely dominated the game. Uh, we got the run game going, uh, which opened up our passing game. And uh, I thought we were extremely well poised to win this game. Um, the uh, the uh, there was a call where we sacked Mahomes. They called illegal contact that led to Kansas City getting a touchdown. And I feel like that's where the momentum of the game sort of shifted. Mm -hmm. And um, as far as the missed field goal, it it all boils down to special teams, man. I mean. Uh, it's it's just one of those things where it's uh it has to be practiced weekly. Everything has to be on the same page. Snap has to be good. Do you think do you think the same way I do that that 
I think that she saw something on film that they could exploit because it just seemed like three guys shoot the gap at the same time. There was just no way to block them all. And it just felt like the Chiefs had practiced that and they saw something on film that they could exploit. It, yeah, it it could it could have been. Um it, but to the point of are the Chiefs as good? No, I don't think they are. Because I think um this has to be at least game six that they've won by less than a touchdown mm-hmm. or maybe even three, four points. I don't yeah. I don't I think I think they're the biggest nine and0 fraud team ever because mm-hmm. there, there's been several games that they could have lost and yeah. some, some could even argue should have lost the Ravens call, big calls at the end of the game non non pass interference issues like a lot of games where they could have easily lost it and probably should have yeah well they've lost uh, they've won seven games by less than seven points so yes the, there's no question they're the kings of close games but is that because they have good coaching and a great quarterback or what, what's the reason for that or great defense i don't i don't i don't think that mahomes is we know mahomes is mahomes he's a great quarterback but he, i mean he's not playing better than you could he's even not argue. playing well I agree yeah hey, you you could argue there's five guys in this league playing better than him right now no doubt and um it, he he had some struggle i mean he lost his number one wide receiver he lost pack the uh, Isaiah Pacquiao, but I mean, I just, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not the, I'm not big on the Chiefs this year. I don't think they're going to win it all this year. I just, I don't feel it. So, my last question to both of you is: Let's get into the ref controversy because there's all this stuff swirling both on the internet and even on uh, Fox Sports One, ESPN about, you know, the refs are out to help the Chiefs go 17 and 0. They want them to go undefeated because of the Taylor Swift thing. Um, you know, they're getting all the calls. There's a bias. Are you guys agreeing with that? Do you think it's some kind of big conspiracy? Do you think it's just a natural bias because people like the Chiefs? Like, what, what's the what's the real scoop here? I mean, I, I definitely think that they get a lot of calls. Like, I can't disagree with that. And it, it shows that they get a lot of calls. And I don't, I don't remember who it was that the Chiefs were playing. It was either last week or the week before. But there was a play where Patrick Mahomes was running out of bounds, and he faked going out of bounds, and then took off for an extra twenty. I remember that. That was a pretty cool play, I thought. But well, it, it is a cool play. But if he would have got lit up right there because he acted like he was going out of bounds, what would have happened? Mm-hmm. True. Definitely be gone, no question. It's not, it's not an illegal play, though. So it's, it's, not, it's more gamesmanship, right? Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I started. Don't, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead, bro. I could. Go I started to notice for the first time the conspiracy theorists started to make a little sense to me when I watched how much holding the Chiefs were doing last year in the Super Bowl. Um, they were absolutely mugging the defensive line for the Niners and called and they led the league in holding and i started to say why why is this happening is it because the refs don't want to be a factor i believe that that could be the case but when they're calling when they're making the call against the other team and they're becoming a factor they don't seem to mind it so i don't know i can't quite go all the way to the conspiracy theorist point of view you started but there's something funny going on with the lack of accountability especially at the end of a game towards the chiefs and there is a an immense amount of accountability going towards the opponent you started, and i don't know why i have no idea i don't think there's any memo been sent out from the league or anything along those lines it's just that's what's been happening you started raising this issue around week three of the season and i, I kept blowing you off and blowing you off no nah, no nah, it's not true Well, these past two weeks, I'm starting to see it now. So I think it's becoming obvious to everybody. There is some kind of slight bias where the refs are favoring the Chiefs. They're not calling it on the Chiefs as much as the other team. So I don't think there's any question about that. But I don't think it's a grand conspiracy. I think it's more kind of like the LeBron James, Michael Jordan factor where a star player who's the face of your league, which is what Mahomes is, gets the calls. 
you know, and it, that doesn't make it fair, but I think that's what's happening. That's just my personal opinion. I don't think it's some grand conspiracy where guys are getting paid off or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, but I there do. are some pretty startling statistics about how many times he's thrown a pick that it got called back. Yeah. It's, it's some dramatically higher than anyone else comparable. Yeah. Right. Well, let's keep watching it this year and see if uh, this is, keeps happening. But I am starting to notice it as well. Let's go to the 49ers. What were you going to say? Go ahead. We're say something. Oh, I, I, I honestly, I lost thought. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. Next one's the 49ers Buccaneers. This should not have been close. Um, the 49ers kicker missed three field goals as well. I don't know what happened to the kicking this weekend, but um, Buccaneers held in there the best they can. Again, they're kind of playing very depleted right now. Mm -hmm. 49ers desperately needed this win really, really badly to stay in the really tough NFC West where they're trailing. And if they had lost this game, they would have been in the last place. Um, they did get a really big game from Kittle. Uh, they had Christian McCaffrey back, but he had just kind of a moderate impact. He's a little rusty right now. Of course, Ayuk is out. <laughs> Debo had a couple big plays, but has largely been a non-factor most of the season. Purdy was just okay. But, um, you know, clearly clearly they were the better team and ended up winning this game, but it really shouldn't have been close. Any thoughts about this one? I wonder if the uh, special teams, the snapper and the kicker, go and uh, hit Debo every time he gets hurt. <laughs> because honestly, I thought that was—I mean, that I thought that was that, that was absolutely uncalled for. Um, I could not believe he did that. And apparently, Shanahan said that they were going to address that on the airplane ride back. Yeah, um, so I just, noticed it. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I. I've said this for a while now. I don't, I don't, I mean, honestly, I don't think Debo's, I mean, he's made of glass. He, when, when he, when he's fully healthy, he, he's consistent sometimes, but mm -hmm. it's just the way he acted like that. It's like, okay, do these guys, every time you have an injury ever, every other week go and blame you that they're losing games. So I, I just thought that was absolutely terrible. I can never imagine a situation where you're so frustrated. Yes, it was his third miss of the day, but you're so frustrated where you go and hit the long snapper and the kicker in the face, yeah. and they're your teammate. Like, what kind of person does that? And he said, well, I was just emotional. And I'm like, it just was so inappropriate. It's unbelievable. Like, I would suspend him if I was the coach for a game or two. I'm kind of torn He's because I like, I like the fire – um, and I do think you handle these things privately. Um, the part I don't like is the lack of accountability on Debo. Um, exactly. Yes. If you're an offense that's clicking, you're scoring touchdowns. You're not relying on kickers to save your bacon every time down the field. Uh, you're, you're getting into the red zone and you're scoring. And that's doing that. So that's where their energy needs to go is – what do we need to do to block harder, run faster, run better routes, watch more film together? We need to be scoring touchdowns and not relying on kickers. Um, everything has to go kind of right for a kicker to hit it, and the, the ball has to be snapped perfectly, and the, the defense can't shoot any gaps, and you have to block really nicely up front, and the kicker's got to – kick it at the right trajectory to not only make it far enough, but high enough to get over these monster guys jumping up. And so I think if you're truly worried about winning, which I think in his heart he is, he should look inward and say, what did we not do on as an offense to score the ball? And occasionally we'll rely on the field goal kicker, but not this many times. I will so, say that Nick Bosa was an absolute monster in this game. I mean, if he wasn't sacking Baker Mayfield, he was putting tremendous pressures all in his face. Yeah. He was, he was the, so everything, good everything he advertised Nick Bosa. You have no alternative but to hold him. He's so powerful. Yeah. yeah. He was a monster in this game. He was crazy. Uh, I found yeah. out after the game, Moody had a high ankle sprain on his plant leg. Yeah. So apparently they almost thought about sitting him and bringing in a kicker off the street for one week, but he talked the coaches into letting him kick, which I'm not sure was the right decision. He goes three for six, but anyway. That's what was more inexcusable about Debo's behavior is this guy's gutting it out trying to perform for our team. Right. Our offense keeps sputtering and handing the ball to this guy who's hurt, and right. I'm going to get in his face? Like it didn't make sense. 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I just think it'd be different if he was if he's been an absolute stud this year and he hasn't. Right. right. So this next game ripped my heart out. Uh, my Commanders really should have won this game, and um, Russell Wilson, who comes in for Justin Fields, who can throw the long ball, finds a way to get it to Mike Williams with a winning score. Uh, Commander still had a chance at the end of the game. I thought that last play was a first down. The rest did not, but that would have given them a chance to set up in field goal range and at least try for a field goal. Really great game, though. It felt like a playoff game. It felt like two yeah. playoff contenders. Uh, last team to get the ball would win kind of thing. Um, any thoughts about this game? I think the muffed punt put this game away for the Steelers. I think that was the turning point. I think that's where things started to really rally for the commanders because I, I, I meant for the Steelers because I thought that the commanders were going to run away with this game, honestly. And then that muff punt got them sort of back on trajectory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought, the, I thought the commanders were going to win this one. When I saw the um, Steelers do their fake punt and they threw it out to the gunner, and and it, he dropped it, uh, and they handed the ball to the commanders on their own. What was it? Fourteen yard line, or mm -hmm. it was deep in there, and and the commanders rammed it in. Um, yeah. I was like, Steelers aren't are playing scared. I mean, that why would you do that? Why right. would you why would you fake that? I, I know it was open, but it's so risky. So and then it didn't play out that way. You know, the Steelers played tough. Uh, Pickens you know, was unbelievable he was incredible but so the was scary they were amazing <laughs> russell was Wilson was pretty comfortable in this system he does he does he's so, made a huge huge difference for them i was totally against him being switched out and i was totally wrong he's if you good. look at the time of possession 36 minutes 11 seconds for the um pittsburgh 23 49 for the um commanders if justin fields had been in the game for the steelers the commanders would have won this game pretty comfortably that's just the bottom line. Probably. Yeah. Probably. Uh, the other thing I noticed that I didn't realize watching the commanders in this game was the commander's offensive line is really good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is really good. I mean, TJ Watt barely sniffed Jaden Daniels. Yeah. And so, uh, man, I'm really hopeful watching. The I'm really so impressed I'm with the Steelers defense too. Mm -hmm. Their it's linebackers good. can really cover. Uh, their back end is better than it's been in a few years. Mm -hmm. Their their defense is legitimate. <clears throat> this was and a I great know game. that Commanders put twenty seven on them, but you know they were gifted seven of that. So this was a great game from beginning to end. This is the kind of yeah. game the NFL loves. You know, really high high play. It felt so like this, a playoff game, no question. This next game was a complete stinker. I don't know what's happened to Sam Darnold. He's fallen off the cliff when it comes to offense. They just can't generate anything. And he's got these great weapons. Uh, they sneak this out 12-7 to 7 against a backup quarterback because Trevor Lawrence is out again. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. They're 7-2, and two, but I find the Vikings incredibly concerning at this point. Um, it's really been about four weeks in a row now of subpar play by a, what should be a really good offense. So thoughts on this one? Vikings red zone offense is absolutely not clicking right now. Like mm -hmm. Sam, Sam Darnold can get you down there, and then it's like they just can't finish it. They can't punch it in. And that's been – I mean, they're still 7-2, and two, but um, they've looked very vulnerable these past couple weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. Defense Their defense is still, is still really legitimate. Good. Um, yes. but their offense is struggling. And so, you know, sometimes you just got to ride out the storm and, and, and play your best football at the end of the year. But yeah, the way Darnold's playing, it's very concerning. Three, three interceptions against the mediocre Jacksonville defense. I think they're mediocre. Some people think they're pretty good, but it's pretty mediocre. They're it's better than their offense, but, mm -hmm. um, didn't, I don't, run the, didn't run the ball very well. He's not making nah. very good decisions. Um, he's got all these big time receivers. He can't get them the ball. I don't know. I'm not sure what's going on. It was so just turnovers kind of, everywhere. Minnesota had good kicking game, four field goals, <laughs> and you know, so that's pretty good. Uh, but an ugly game all around. I mean, Mac Jones was throwing picks. 
and mm-hmm. Darnold was throwing picks yep. and Darnold's fumbling and you know this was the, the right complete was opposite of the Steelers complete opposite of the Steelers commanders game where it was really pleasing to watch. It's just, it's just so amazing to me. You tell me uh, an offense has Jordan Addison, um TJ Hawkinson. Yeah, Justin Jefferson, Justin Jefferson, Aaron Jones, and you say and they're going to play the two and seven Jaguars, and they're not going to score a touchdown. I'd say and they're going to put up four field goals. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> to me, this was like a poor man's Bills Colts game. <laughs> like, yeah, pretty much interceptions yeah. on both sides. Like yeah. <laughs> it was every t- both teams on in both games trying to lose. <laughs> so this next game, um, Justin Herbert looked the best he's looked the entire season. Of course, he started the season kind of banged up. He was hurt and wasn't really healthy till about week five or six, playing a pretty bad Titans team. So I'm trying to figure out if it was that they were, he was playing the Titans or is that he's really rounding into shape. It's starting to really look good. Obviously, the Jim Harbaugh program will eventually kick in. Um, but any thoughts about this and the Chargers and whether they're rounding into form like it looks like? I'm starting to like it. Um, I wasn't a big fan of Harborough uh, with Herbert because I thought it would sort of limit his quarterback play in a mm-hmm. way because I think Harborough uh, likes to run the ball with different schemes and such. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think they're starting to look pretty good. Um, the defense is a little concerning for me, but um, I think the Chargers offense is starting to click pretty well. Mm-hmm. And the defense has the the personnel, and yeah. so you have to think. Yeah, they it. actually played well in this game. Um, they they mm-hmm. had seven sacks. Mm-hmm. And another thing that that's nice. First of all, Harbaugh always attaches to his quarterback. He becomes buddies with him. He he's a he's a support system. He writes him into his his will. Like, you know, they they were talking about how Herbert was wearing these warm up tennis shoes around and. Uh, Harbaugh asked his assistant to go buy him a pair in his size. He wanted to wear the same warm-up shoes that Herbert was wearing. This is the kind of crazy stuff that really goes well in the locker room. But they love it. The players it love sounds it. crazy to the outside yeah. world, but yeah. I'm telling you, when you're a part of it, you 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 love Harbaugh as your coach. And so it's, it's going to take time, but they're all going to be a happy family um, fighting for each other, just like – it kind of reminds me of the Lions about a year or two ago. Mm-hmm. That's what's coming. This is coming. Yeah. Um, the other thing is they're good in the red zone. Yeah. Uh, he was three of five in the red zone, and right. um, the Titans were one for three. So, you know that that that's makes a difference when you're when you're getting touchdowns. Um, so they're doing they, what the Vikings are not doing right now. <laughs> red zone. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. right. They need Harbaugh. <laughs> yeah, pretty no, much. I'm just kidding. No, I think he he knows that they're going to have to have relatively low scoring games. Um, so his defense is going to have to play better. They had seven sacks here, so that was great. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they try to control the ball. They, they kind of struggled with running the ball, but um, mm-hmm. they were able to punch it in when they needed to and not walk away with field goals. And even worse, having your kicker miss things and then have infighting on your sidelines. So True. it's, it's all about building a culture. And this is really part of what it looks like is right. nothing flashy, but just getting wins and doing it in a way that, that builds confidence. Next game is the Cardinals jets. This was a, <laughs> bit, a bit of a surprise to me. I knew the Cardinals would probably win because the jets are a dumpster fire, but I didn't see 31 to six. Um, <laughs> And I didn't see the Jets looking like one of the worst teams in football. They're kind of down there with the Cowboys right now. Any initial thoughts about, first of all, the rise of the Cardinals? They, they look legit to me. And then yeah. uh, and then the Jets, it looks like they're going to have to blow it up in the offseason. That's what it looks like. Yeah, I can, I can get behind the Cardinals. Um, I think they're playing extremely well. I think uh, week by week they're um, shown disrespect by everybody. You know, oh, we're just playing the Cardinals this week. You know, the Jets were, I think, like two and a half point favorites against Mm -hmm. the Cardinals. And then the Cardinals blows them out 31 to six. And so, yeah, it's technically considered an upset, but it's not. Yeah. I I don't, I don't view it as an upset. No. No, not at all. 
So the, st- the statistics were pretty um, evident as to why this game was pretty one-sided. Arizona had uh, 28 first downs. The Jets had 17 yards, 406 to 207. Um, sat three sacks and a fumble recovery for the um, Cardinals. Kyler Murray himself was 22 of 24, 91% completion rate. One touchdown throwing and two running. Almost a perfect game. He he was a force. You know, he yeah. he's becoming a force because I think he's watching video and I think he's connecting with his team a little better. He's mm-hmm. not sulking when things aren't going right. I think he's a lot more of the solution. Right. Somebody got a hold of him or something. Somebody's made an impact in his life to where he's he's become a different player. I you could feel this coming, I think, at the end of last year. I could. And that's why I was telling you in some of our early podcasts um, that they were dramatically going to be better. I didn't know how much better, but you could feel they were going to be better. I and a lot of it's Kyler players. Murray, to be honest. Now you've given be him probably the best receiver in this draft, who he's only going to get better too. So it's uh, and Connor's the disrespect that's come towards them. Kyler Murray is a coach's son with a lot of physical skills and tools. It's coming together there. By the way, his tight end, McBride, has been going crazy. He's one of the real surprises of the NFL season, McBride. And Connor is healthy this year. Last year he was hurt. So Connor's having a great season. He's my They're, fantasy quarterback, and he's doing great. So it's it's a mean, scary team to play. You mean fantasy running back? Fantasy running back. What did I say? Yeah, yeah. fantasy quarterback. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so this too. next one here uh, was an interesting game. I went to bed last night. Uh, at the beginning of the fourth quarter and the Lions were losing 23 to 13. And I thought to myself, would I be shocked if I wake up tomorrow morning and the Lions won this game? And I told myself, no, I would not be shocked. (laughs) And they, and they, and they win the game on a last second field goal by this guy on the right, who 18 months ago was working as a brick salesman and was sitting on his couch midway through last season when their, their uh, kicker got hurt. And they asked him if he wanted to come and try out and kick that weekend. <laughs> and he's like, oh, heck yes. And so this guy, what a great story for this guy, Bates, who uh, mm-hmm. goes from brick salesman to winning kicker in the NFL. But any thoughts on this game? They broke a pretty interesting statistic. They were 0-15 every time they've been um, losing by 15 or more points at halftime. Mm-hmm. And so um, – I thought, uh, honestly, the way the first half went, I thought the Texans were going to blow them out. Um, Golf did not off of they, you know, they run a lot of play action, and uh, the Texans were just all over it. They couldn't get their run game going, and um, they made some, the Lions made some adjustments. They needed to get turnovers. They did. They got picks. And uh, what's really impressive to me in this game I know we talked about this. Jared Goff had five interceptions. I don't think right. they were all on him. I think about two of them were his fault. But the fact that you win this game with that many turnovers is impressive to me. What do what good good teams do? They win even when they're not playing well. And and this was the worst I've seen Goff look in two or three years. Like it mm-hmm. really was his worst game. And the fact that they beat a playoff team in this type of situation, you're right, is darn impressive. The fact that I woke up this morning, they actually had won it. I was like, wow, that's incredible. Your thoughts, Robbie, on this one? I think there's a lot of championship teams like the Chiefs that win these ugly games. Uh, It shows a winning culture where you can overcome any kind of stats that would guarantee a loss, and you're just not going to allow it to happen. You're going to will yourself to the victory. It's – incredible that they won it with five picks from Goff. Uh, first of all, what kind of confidence Goff must have to be able to overcome that? <laughs> like, well, uh, one of them, one of them was a Hail Mary right before halftime that got picked off. So I, re- I really consider it more like four picks. But, yeah. But yeah. Um, did you guys see the weird play where the Texans lineman ran into CJ Stroud and stripped him of the ball? Yeah, that was, that was <laughs> so weird. Yeah. That was super awkward. It was like I don't know what to make of that play. 
Yeah, I didn't know what he was trying to accomplish there. <laughs> he was trying you know, to take the ball from Stroud because he was getting sacked, I guess. Yeah, maybe he was trying to be so nice. He was like, no, I won't let them sack you. Let them sack me instead. Well, I think he was trying to take the ball from Stroud and turn around and start running, barreling forward for a couple of yards just so it's not a big loss. And in that exchange, he stripped the ball and it went out. Like, it got loose. Yeah, yeah. It was weird. Yeah, I was with – uh Zach, though, at halftime, 23 to 7, and the Texans felt like they were really frustrated. They had lost two out of three coming into this game and, and really yeah. had not been playing well. They didn't have Nico Collins for a couple weeks. And um, I thought they were going to blow the Lions out, and the Lions had finally, you know, we're going to lose one, even though they had a really great season going. Yeah, I think but then, so. but then third quarter, they score six points. So when I go to bed, it's 23 to 13. I thought to myself, you know, the Lions have plenty of horsepower to get this done. That's what I thought to myself. I think it's a pretty good statement on the Lions' defense. I think we we might be overlooking. I mean, first of all, look at this. Look at the scoreboard: zeros in the third and fourth quarter. Without Hutchison. <laughs> um, granted, they stopped, they stopped throwing so many picks, but God, I mean, that defense had to really step up to oh, hold the line. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, Rob. The big thing for me. As the Texans, it was like we were just, they were just trying to waste clock to win the game. And they started to run the ball on first, second, third down, and then throw it on – or first, second down, then throw it on third down. And the Lions are like probably, if not the best, run defense, second or third best. I mean, yeah. Mixon was not doing anything. No. And so – He only had 46 yards. Yeah, exactly. Where five carries. Exactly. So where were they where were they getting that offense from in the first half? Throwing the ball. And it's like they put took the pedal off the gas. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like you need to keep attacking them. But great overall win for the Lions. It was. It was. So last game was the woeful Cowboys go down 34 to 6 to the team that Zach was just talking about, the Eagles, who are looking very much like not just a playoff contender, but maybe a title contender. And the Cowboys look completely hapless. Uh, they kept bringing in a different quarterback every series. One time it would be Cooper Rush, then it would be Trey Lance. Cooper Rush ended up with something like 48 yards passing for the entire game. And um, this is when they have these high-priced receivers, and they cannot run the ball. They're getting like one yard of carry. It looks to me like McCarthy's dead man walking. I think, um, you know, CeeDee Lamb's probably going to ask for a trade in the offseason. They're just in complete disarray. And I know that uh, Bill Belichick is going to be meeting with Jerry Jones this week. What are your thoughts about, is this more about the Eagles being this good or is this more about the Cowboys being maybe the worst team in football? I mean, you know, I'm big on the Eagles right now. I think the Eagles have a really good team. But I also think that the Cowboys are just in a huge disarray. And um, they're, I don't see it getting better this, at least this year. Mm -hmm. You can see the frustration on CeeDee Lamb's face right there. <laughs> He's like, how did I end on, on this team? Oh my gosh. I think it's pretty remarkable to draw a straight line uh, for AJ Brown's healthiness. How they play when he's in is dramatically different. It is than incredible. It is incredible. They That's were true. very beatable when he was out, and they have other weapons, but he makes all those weapons work. And when he and Devontae Smith were both out, which was two weeks in a row, I mean, yeah. the Eagles' offense was almost unwatchable. They were pitiful. Pitiful. <laughs> so you're right. Their receivers are incredibly important in their offense. They yeah. give her a lot of confidence. He's like a leader on the field, A.J. Brown, and there's something about a comfort level for him. When he's on the field, everyone feels comfortable, and they are a different team. And then so they start the, running that ball and just ramming it down your throat. The key to uh, their success in playoffs is going to be to keep those two guys healthy. Really and Lane Johnson had some injuries earlier in the year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's but also, one of the Rob, we talked about it. There are rookies that they drafted in that great draft this offseason that we talked about with Zach on, on that episode. Yeah. They're all they're all coming on now. They got rookie safeties. They got rookie cornerbacks. They're all playing well now. And coming on. And on the other side, Dallas is a dumpster fire. They have I think Jerry Jones is an OK owner and a terrible general manager. 
and mm -hmm. he's allowed their three stars to come up for for contracts in the same year. Um, they had to pay two of them. And they're stuck now, um, not being able to pay Micah. Really, they're not sure how they're going to do that. Um, they are completely devoid of talent now. They have no. They have the worst running back room in uh, in football. They have one of the worst wide receiver rooms in football, except for C.D. Lamb, of course. They don't have anything spectacular at tight end. Their offensive line, they're trying to rebuild it with a youth movement that's not working very well. Do you so think either of C.D. Disaster. Do you think C.D. Lamb or Micah are going to want to stick around for this, or do you think they're going to ask for a sign and trade? I don't so know. I mean, they could trade Micah pretty easily, but I don't think C.D. Lamb is going to be that easy to trade. Yeah. So they're stuck with CD now. They're stuck with Dak now. And they're not stuck with Micah. He's the only guy. I would trade Micah. I'd try and get picks. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think one of the most interesting things for me about the Cowboys is is the downfall of the defense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not, it's not good. I mean, mm -hmm. last, last year, their defense was incredible. And mm -hmm. it's just – I mean, I know they've had injuries, but it's it's just like they're not playing with that same swagger. And I think I think it's a twofold thing at the same time. Like you can't just put it all on them when your offense isn't clicking, your defense isn't doing very well. So, but yeah. the whole that's what's happening to the Jets. The Jets' defense is looks so much worse because it's not complimentary football. That's so what it is. It's complimentary football. I guarantee yeah. you, both the Cowboys and Jets' defense is better than they've looked because their that's offense right. is so pitiful. Yeah. Although last year the Cowboys that. had very undersized linebackers that got pushed around in the running game a lot. They did. They did. And they yeah. needed to address that in the draft, and they didn't. So right. they got rid of an old lineman, brought in a young lineman. Yeah, so I would, correct, I would correct Zach a little bit on his statement. The, the defensive backfield was pretty good last year for the Cowboys, but their run defense was terrible. Yeah. Like they That's were right. all over at the end of the year last year. They could pressure the quarterback and they could um, make secondary plays, but they were not good against the run. That's right. Well, let's like take a look at the power rankings right now. We got Detroit, Kansas City, Buffalo, Baltimore, Washington. Those are the top five according to NFL.com. You guys have any problems with any of those? You think anybody else should be in there? I think I, I think the Eagles should be five instead of the Commanders. Um, okay. That's just my opinion, of course, but I think uh, I think the commanders haven't proved that they can be good teams yet. Um, but we'll see. Okay. Well, they're very close with the Ravens, uh, obviously, and uh, very close with the Steelers. But you're right; lost both those games very narrowly. Mm -hmm. Anybody, Robbie, you'd put in the top five? Uh, I think when healthy, the Eagles belong up there. And I'm not sure – Buffalo really hasn't beaten anybody. So when they've played good teams, they got smoked. Mm -hmm. So I'd probably drop them, of course. Mm -hmm. But I'd probably drop Kansas City too just to because work. what we're seeing. They well, have limitations of, on offense. Speaking of Kansas City, last week they were at 14. Now they're at 15 straight wins, which just doesn't happen in the NFL. So what, what are you guys attributing this to? Is it coaching? Is it – the number one defense in the NFL statistically? Is it Mahomes? Is it the refing? You know, what is it that these guys are doing to win 15 straight? It's a little, I think it's a little bit of everything. Yeah, it's it's not the refing. Yeah. Like, even though I, I think they get a lot of strange calls and no calls, but that's not why they're winning and, you know, not losing. They're winning – because of their coach and their quarterback yeah. and that defense. And that formula works. The, co the works. coach and the quarterback do just enough offensively to keep it close near the end of the game and give their special quarterback an opportunity to win it. And, and their, their, defense, their defense holds down the other team the whole game until they're completely out of sorts. And, and by the way, they believe in special teams, whereas guys like Shanahan do not. And we'll talk about yeah. that in a second. But you know, like Andy Reid is really into special teams. He yeah. always hires the best special teams coach. That's right. He believes all three phases are really important, and that's part of complementary football. And some guys do not believe that, but he does believe that. 
Reed and Belichick are known for being two of the most uh, ardent supporters of the special teams. Yeah, that's right. And there's two of the best coaches that ever lived. So in terms of the power rankings, Eagles, you see there on the right, uh, you already guys already mentioned that they probably should be up there. Chargers, where do you guys put the Chargers right now? Are they top 10? They're yeah. heading in the right direction, but they're not there yet. They probably will be next year. Next year. Agreed. Agreed. Top, top 15, maybe? Okay. Top 10. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're, I think they're, yeah, top 10. Yeah. I'm good. What about the Broncos? I'm going to ask Zach first. <laughs> where do you put them right now? Um, if you can be objective. <laughs> if I can be objective, I think we're, I think we're a wild card contender. I mean, I just, uh, I think if we would have beat the Chiefs, it would have been a different story. Um, that was a heartbreak loss for us in a lot of ways, in my opinion. Um, so, mm-hmm. but um, I, I think I think we're wild card contenders. Um, we're probably in that twelve to fourteen range somewhere. Yeah, there. I think I think our def- I think our defense is going to keep yeah. making noise, and Bo Nix is only going to get better. So, mm-hmm. and all and they, they need can- now is a few weapons. Yeah. They need to go get a tight end and a number one. They need a running back, a tight end, and a wide receiver. That's what they need. I'll say, uh, just to quickly talk about the running back situation, I think our run game has gotten better as Bo Nix has progressed more Mm -hmm. just because he's able to throw the ball instead of us being so one-dimensional. But yeah, we do not have a clear running back guy. But Plus, Bo Nix picks up quite a few first downs with his legs. So yeah, he, yeah, he's he does. He's, he, he's a good little scrambler. He does a good job. Yeah. So next team's the 49ers. Where do you guys think they are right now? They're sitting at five and four. They barely squeaked out a win. They've just felt incredibly inconsistent all year. Um, Purdy has not played as well. His weapons have not been on the field. Finally, they're getting Christian McCaffrey back, which should make a difference. Where do you put them right now? I mean, it's not. I think it's hard to not put them in the top ten, but it's they're very inconsistent. That's the toughest thing. Am I the only one who doesn't feel like they're a contender this year? I don't know. I just there's just something missing. Every, their players every are missing. Problem. They're hurt. <laughs> so yeah. They don't have good backups to their starters that are stars. So Every week is a struggle for them. It just seems like they're scratching Every week up they have players that are playing hurt. Mm-hmm. Even kickers are hurt. You know, it just. Yeah. I don't know. We'll don't... see. We'll see if they can rise or not. Next team is the Steelers. They're definitely a top 10 team in my mind. It's a pretty solid team. The way they play complimentary football, the coaching. Agreed. Russell Wilson playing solid. They can beat you on the ground and in the air now, which is nice for them. Yeah, Their defense is solid. Pickens, Mike Williams. Yeah, I, I think they're a solid playoff team for sure. Vikings, I think they're regressing. That's what it looks like to me. I think Vikings. their defense is still strong, but their offense has really off days. I think Vikings is going to be the Cowboys of the playoffs this year. One and done? Yeah. Okay. I could see that for sure. They, they've really faded offensively. I'm not sure what it is. Final one is the Packers. They've had probably the most injuries in the NFC. Can't keep their quarterback healthy. They do have a really good running game. I think Malik Willis plays pretty well as a backup. They've got good receivers, really young team, decent defense. Think they're going to be able to sneak into the playoffs? I think it all depends on Jordan Love. I thought they did not handle that situation correctly with him being hurt. I thought they rushed him back too soon. Mm-hmm. I agree. Um, and so, Malik was playing well, so I don't know why they did it. Yeah, ex- exactly. And and also, I mean, it's it's to your point. I mean, if he if if Jordan loves your guy, he needed to sit another week or two. I thought they brought him back way too soon. I agree with that. Absolutely. So looking at the playoff picture, if it ended today, which it won't, but you see that your uh, Denver Broncos sneak in at the seven seed on the AFC side, the commanders at number six, your two number one seeds with a bye would be the Chiefs and the Lions. 
you'd have the Ravens and the Vikings at the number five seeds. The number two number two seeds would be Buffalo and the Eagles. Any of these surprise you? Any of these you think you're going to go up or down seeding wise? I think the Falcons will go down. You you think the Buccaneers still have a chance to win that division? I think so. If if the Falcons can't figure some things out, yeah, I don't I don't see why they couldn't. The strength of the team is supposed to be its offense. Mm-hmm. because that defense was ranked 30th last year, and they only drafted a tiny bit of help for that. So the defense is the weak point on that team. If the offense is going to not carry the team, then they're not they're not going to win the division. But I, I anticipate they'll get some stuff straightened out. They have some nice players, mm-hmm. and they have invested a lot of money in running the ball. They need to run Bijan a little more. You know, they, they need to – I agree keep control of of the game so that their defense isn't on the field too long. So with this scenario, you have two divisions that get three teams in. You have the AFC West gets three teams in and the NFC North gets three teams in, which is kind of, kind of interesting. It's kind of wild. I can look at every single team and point out a game that they look terrible in and point out flaws in that team. Yeah. There's no team here that's a shoe in Which is what we said earlier, that that is true on the college it's side, too, scary. which is usually not true. But the, uh, everyone's beatable on the college side, and everyone is definitely beatable. Would it the shock side. you if Denver beat Buffalo? It wouldn't shock me. No. Would it shock yeah. you um, if Green Bay beat the Eagles? No. Would it, would it shock you if the Cardinals beat the Vikings? Perhaps that's what exactly what no. I was going to say. No. I, I wouldn't be shocked if the Cardinals won that game by 20. <laughs> I, don't, well, I don't think, I don't think the Texans. Minnesota's D is pretty good. So it, it, but I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't be too surprised if they played well and they won. I don't think the Texans would beat the Ravens, but it wouldn't shock me if they did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like. Well, how do you know the Ravens won't just stop running the ball and just throw it all over the yard? Like <laughs> – and get beat again. I know. That's right. It just makes it so unpredictable, just like the college yeah. game. It's crazy. It's pretty exciting. So next one is the rookie QBs in 2024. These are the power rankings as of right now. Jaden Daniels, if you look at his first season, it's almost identical to Robert Griffin III in 2012. Both of them were the number two pick in those two seasons. It is incredible how identical their stats are. And, uh, you know, he's probably the best uh, rookie really since Robert Griffin III or or maybe um, I don't know who else you'd want to compare him to, but pretty incredible. And everyone's kind of agreeing that he's the best out of that class. And we called it on that draft special we did together. Drake May right now is ranked number two, the way he's looked the last two weeks. Caleb Williams has really been struggling. I'm not sure why he's three. I'd probably put Bo Nix three. Uh, yeah. Penix hadn't really played, and Spencer Rattler looked completely unprepared in his two starts when he started for the Saints. Lost both of them very badly. How, how disrespectful is it that Michael Penix Jr. is ranked above him? Wow. But I would put him above him. <laughs> he hasn't even taken a snap. I know. I know. <laughs> so, it's so true, though. <laughs> any disagreement with May above Williams? Yeah, I disagree. It should be Daniels, Nix, May, Williams, Radler, and then Penix last because Penix is probably going to get up there really soon. But if he hadn't really played, then he's not showing what he's about yet. Like I was watching NFL Network and they were breaking down May versus Williams. They were showing their pocket presence. They were showing their stances, their feet their delivery, their decision-making, their reading of defenses. And, and they literally, they had a little checkbox for every single one of them. And May was better than Caleb the last two weeks in every category. So that's why they have them above them in this chart. Any argument that Nick should also be above Williams right now? I think we, so. I just said he should be second. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think this is an impressive class. I think if you look five years from now, at least most of these guys will have real successful careers, I think. Not sure about Rattler, but we shall see. Probably just a career backup. Yeah, that's right. 
So special teams play in the NFL, can't misplay. This is the black field goal. This is what Zach doesn't want to talk about. Chiefs defeat Denver with a special team. Excellent play. Justin Tucker with his missed field goals this year. Why is the Ravens historically accurate kicker struggling? You have NFL kickers endure a rough afternoon of missed field goals. We've gone through that a little bit already. Mm-hmm. You've got Koo who takes the blame for the loss to the Saints. He said the game was fully on him. Yeah, he missed three out of four. Yeah. You have uh, Debo Samuel who was frustrated, and, and uh, Zach mentioned that he went and he slugged two of his teammates in the face <laughs> and now is saying that uh, we were just frustrated and we'll get past it. So I guess, guess they're trying to take it back behind closed doors. Uh, and then you have Kittle uh, reveals his interesting superstition. So apparently his whole career, he's always had his back to the field goal. He never watches field goals. And he said he doesn't even watch them up on the scoreboard. And he said yesterday he watched the first Moody miss standing towards the field goal watching it. And he said he broke his superstition. And he said so the rest of the game he turned his back to the field goals again, including the game winner. So uh, I could see Kittle. He's kind of a weird guy. I could see him having a weird superstition like that. Like somehow he's going to affect the outcome of a field goal. Any thoughts about any of these uh, special teams play highlights? I mean, special teams wins games. Special teams can lose games. It's very important all around the board. I will say I think – um with the as we're progressing more and more towards analytics of fourth and going for it we're I think we're slowly starting to see less field goals and um so it's and like more turnover on downs if you will so Mm -hmm. so it's uh I don't want to say it's not them getting reps that the accuracy has because I mean the accuracy you could argue these past two to three weeks hasn't been that great and right. and so I, I don't I don't I I don't have an answer for what it what it is and they're also missing a lot of extra points this year more yeah. than usual more than usual so I don't know you know you know what I'm it. hearing I'm hearing that a lot of the young offensive minded offensive coordinators who are now head coaches never cared much about special teams and it's starting to show like Kyle Shanahan. <laughs> in like Kyle Shanahan, yeah. like um, guy in Atlanta. Um and it, and it really hurts them. A lot of the a lot of these guys. Mm-hmm. Uh the young young gun um coaches are not concentrating on special teams. The old guard really concentrates on special teams. So the the more traditional coaches tend to focus on it more. Um mm-hmm. One thing that's not in this list, but it was a special teams blunder, was the Steeler fake punt that handed the Commanders a touchdown. Really, mm-hmm. in terrible field position, they I shouldn't have done that, that. And that's just where you you're too beholden to analytics. I don't think analytics would say go for it inside your own red zone. That doesn't make any sense. Even well, analytics make it look like a punt and go for it. I don't know, but statistically, I guess it says that you you tend to make it on fourth downs, Hmm. but I don't know. know. Let's talk about the guys who actually care about special teams and they emphasize it. The first one is Andy Reid. He talks about it literally all the time, that it's just as important as offense and defense. Mm -hmm. Really old school in his thinking when it comes to special teams. Another one is Mr. Sean McVay. Mm -hmm. I would obviously put Belichick on this list, but he's not currently coaching, but he would definitely be probably the number one guy. He was really into special teams. But Sean McVay always talks about the importance of it. Uh, you got Dan Campbell, who uh, thinks it's very, very important, although uh, he tends to sometimes go for it on fourth down when he should take the field goal. But yeah, it's a whole other story. <laughs> and then uh, John Harbaugh also talks a lot about uh, his special teams unit and how important they are to their success. Thoughts about these four old school guys? I mean, I think the I think the Steelers need to be on that list as well. Mm-hmm. I think they have one of the best special team coaches, if not the best special team coach in the NFL. Mm-hmm. I can but, see that. But um, yeah, Dan Campbell, you never know what you're going to get with him. I mean, the, the dude, he, he he loves some risky plays, but um, 
I think I think honestly that pairing of that kicker and him was one of the best things for I, I agree with that. not not only the kicker but for Dan Campbell as well because now he has a guy that he believes in. That's mm-hmm. right. Yep. He, they just seem to be a perfect pairing. I agree with that. Yeah, all these guys uh, really understand that uh, complementary football includes all three phases, not just two phases. So, so going and, to the guy. Go ahead. And I think old school tends to emphasize um, field position over analytics. Mm-hmm. That's really the struggle is field position um, would create more of a punting situation, more of a take the field goal, don't go for it on fourth inside their 30. Mm-hmm. Um, get points, get points, keep momentum. It's being aware of momentum. It's field position. It's uh, trust your defense. That's what old school is, and you could see it. Well, and Zach would add uh, the Steelers here, and I agree with that. The Steelers should be. I on tend to, I tend to agree with it for sure, but mm-hmm. they did make a big blunder this last week. <laughs> they did. But they did. that's not in character for them, I would say normally. Mm-hmm. So does not care about special teams. The first one is Kyle Shanahan. It's pretty. Um, Oh, yeah. widely, widely known in the league that he really blows it off. He doesn't take it seriously. He doesn't even go to the meetings. He just kind of uh, doesn't think it's important, which I think is a real Achilles heel for him, and it's starting to really show now. Um, uh, they've, they've had some of the largest um, returns given this year on their special teams, so it's not just kicking. It's also uh, coverage on both sides. So um, I don't know. Maybe one of these days he'll actually get it and understand how important special teams is next one's Eberflus. apparently he's never really been big on it doesn't want to talk about it uh, just wants to talk about defense uh then we got mccarthy is another one and then uh sirianni although i will uh, say mccarthy has the best kicker in football he so. does but he kind of lucked into that you know they got yeah him yeah he got a little guy. lucky yeah so what do you guys think about these guys who are kind of not really into special teams per se? When it comes when it comes to Sirianni, I may not be either if if I had the tush push capabilities that the Eagles have. <laughs> so, that was what I was literally about to say. I want to thank uh, Zach for joining us tonight to talk about the NFL. Thank you so much, Zach. And uh, thanks, Zach. Hope to see you guys uh, again in the near future. Well, final thoughts on our weekend as we close out Veterans Day? Well, I mean, it was a great week in sports again. There were there were interesting stories, great celebrations, big upsets in college, decent amount of upsets in, in pro. Just a great sports week. Uh, MLS was intriguing. So just a lot of fun stuff to catch up to, and it was fun. It was a fun week. Well, your Dolphins are winning 10-6 to 6 right now, so it's a good thing. We'll uh, close out now. We'll go watch the end of Monday Night Football. Let's go. go Dolphins. Super yep. Bowl, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you guys so much for joining tonight, the Sports Guys, for a weekend update. Thank you to Zach Thompson, to Rob Pope. Let's have another great weekend of sports coming up. It just gets better and better, and we're really excited to see where this goes. And uh, the playoffs are approaching in both leagues. And uh, let's have a great weekend. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Zach, for joining us. I know you had to go, but we appreciate it. And uh, thank you to all the veterans. I know we said it earlier, but I wanted to say it as well. And uh, for all your service, keeping us safe, and really sacrificing um, to the veterans and their families. The sacrifice is huge and much appreciated, and we are forever indebted. So thank you. All right. We'll see you guys next time on the Sports Guys. Have a great night. See you.